I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened, and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. For the time was fast approaching when the first should be last, and the last should be first. forgotten until we had left the house and gone some distance when Henry and Will returned and killed it. Over the next 24 hours, Nat Turner led a small group of slaves from farm to farm, killing every white man, woman, and child they encountered. They gathered guns and more recruits during a brief but bloody revolt that spread terror throughout the slaveholding South. Nat Turner was captured and hanged. In the days before his execution, he agreed to tell his story. But after his death, his words became the property of others, as his body was during his life. His story has been continually retold since 1831. He has been depicted as a great and inspiring hero and vilified as an insane fanatic. Each author possesses Nat Turner, transforming his identity and the meaning of his revolt. Although today we cannot clearly make out the face of the man, he continues to provoke a bitter debate over the violence that he inspired. For a nation to come to terms with the legacy of slavery, Nat Turner remains a troublesome property. Nat Turner's slave rebellion triggered a massive mobilization of local militia and vigilante units in Virginia and neighboring North Carolina. As many as 3,000 armed men were called into action to fight what turned out to be 60 to 80 rebels. The balance of sheer military power was weighted tremendously against the slaves in this country. Slaves don't have the organization, the access to arms, the military tradition to be able to mobilize a successful insurrection. Slavery itself was such an abomination that I could see how it would drive men and women to do desperate things. Um, and a slave revolt by its nature to me is a pretty des desperate act. Outraged by the sight of the victims of the revolt, including many badly mutilated women and children, the militia and vigilante units engaged in a slaughter of their own. violent, brutal reaction is meant as a warning. It's meant to frighten those who might be contemplating acts like this in the future. It's meant to demonstrate the power of white society. At least 50 and perhaps many more slaves and free blacks were summarily executed in the days after the suppression of the rebellion. There's no question that there's a cult of violence that surrounds the tension between black and white during slavery times and after. It's hard for us to 
to fathom cutting off people's heads and putting them on poles, parading them around, hanging bodies up in chains, dismembering the body, taking home souvenirs. We know all about the victims, the white victims of Turner's Rebellion, who they were, where they were killed, what their names were, what their families were. Nobody knows the names of even all the participants in the Turner Rebellion, and certainly all the innocent blacks who were killed or, or, or imprisoned or, or beaten afterwards. That, this is not part of our official historical memory. That, that, that piece of the story is just uh, forgotten or suppressed and probably can never really be completely recovered. If a lot of those black people were not the property of white people, a lot more of them would be killed. Wasn't it Virginia law that said if you kill somebody's slave, the state had to reimburse them the cost of the slave or something like that? Bailiff, will you approach, please? Every rebel except Nat Turner was quickly killed or captured. During the month of September and on into October, nearly 50 accused rebels stood trial in Southampton County. Stand up. Guilty as charged. You shall be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The prisoner is guilty. The court doth value the said slave to the sum of $425. Ultimately, 19 were hanged, hanged while others were transported and sold outside the boundaries of the state. The court recommends to the governor that the punishment be commuted to transportation. And still, Nat Turner remained at large. On September 17, 1831, Virginia Governor John Floyd issued a proclamation offering a $500 reward for the capture of Nat Turner. Nat is between 30 and 35 years old, 5 feet 6 or 8 inches high, weighs between 150 and 160 pounds, rather bright complexion, but not a mulatto. Broad-shouldered, large, flat nose, large eyes, broad, flat feet, rather not... Governor Floyd's description of Nat Turner is the closest thing we have to a portrait of the man. But it is nothing more than a wanted poster, created to help white men capture a fugitive. We do not know exactly what happened at the capture of Nat Turner, but a 19th century engraving offers one possible image of the moment. We do know it was not until October 30th, 70 days after the outbreak of the rebellion, that Benjamin Phipps stumbled onto Nat Turner's hiding place. The slave had never wandered further than a few miles from his home farm. Come on out of there. You come on out of there now. What? It down. I said put it down. The next morning, he was taken to the Southampton County Jail in Jerusalem to await trial. It was there in a jail cell that Nat Turner first encountered a local lawyer, Thomas R. Gray. Over the next three days, Gray interviewed Turner and then published his version of Turner's story, which later became the main source for all future interpretations of the man. The late insurrection in Southampton greatly excited the public mind and led to thousands of idle, exaggerated, and mischievous reports. Everything connected to that sad affair was wrapped in mystery until Nat Turner, the leader of that ferocious band whose name resounded throughout our widely extended empire, was captured. Since his confinement, with permission of the jailer, I have had ready access to him and determined for the gratification of public curiosity to commit his statements to writing and to publish them with little or no variation to his own words. Nobody can, I think, say precisely why Thomas R. Gray went into the jail cell on November the 1st, 1831. It could be that he just wanted the public to know. He felt the public had a right to know what Nat Turner had done from Nat Turner's own point of view. 
It could be that he sought prestige after a great drop in his own reputability by going in and making himself as famous as he could by being Nat Turner's amanuensis, taking down what he said. He could have been thinking of uh, the income he might derive. You have asked me to give you the history of the motives which induced me to undertake the late insurrection, as you call it. To do so, I must go back to the days of my infancy and even before I was born. I was 31 years of age on the 2nd October last, born the property of Benjamin Turner of this county. Being at play with other children when three, four years old, I was telling them something which my mother overhearing said it had happened before I was born. I stuck to my story, however, and related some things which went, in her opinion, to confirm it. Others being called on were greatly astonished, knowing that these things had happened, and caused them to say, in my hearing, I surely would be a prophet, as the Lord had shown me things that happened before my birth. Many historians are not convinced that all, or even most of the and words Gray attributes to Turner were actually spoken by him. There is no Nat Turner back there whole to be retrieved. You'd have to go and create Nat Turner. I and mean, we have a very fragmented, um, disjointed narrative, which purports to be the confessions. And there's the question of, whose voice is there. I do not believe for a moment that Nat Turner talked that way. It is very clear by now that we cannot take Nat Turner's confessions at face value. But it is also very clear that we cannot cast it aside. Gray's Confessions of Nat Turner creates a definite image of the man, but we can never be sure the face we see is that of Nat Turner. I was praying one day at my plow. The Spirit spoke to me, saying, Seek ye the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. What do you mean by the Spirit? The Spirit that spoke to the prophets in former days. Nat Turner must have eaten up the Christian and Hebrew scriptures and must have begun to feel and see and sense himself as the embodiment of these. The thunder rolled in the heavens and blood flowed in streams. And I heard a voice saying, such is your luck. Such you are called. And let it come, rough or smooth, you must surely bear it. While laboring in the field, I discovered drops of blood on the corn, as though it were dew from heaven, and communicated it to many, both white and black in the neighborhood. And I then found on the leaves in the woods hieroglyphic characters and numbers with the forms of men in different attitudes portrayed in blood and representing figures I had seen before in the heavens. And on the 12th of May, 1828, I heard a loud noise in the heavens and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said that the serpent was loosened and that Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. For the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first. Do you not find yourself mistaken now? Was not Christ crucified? Was not Christ crucified? <laughs> That's an astonishing statement by a man who's chained to the wall. You're going to be hanged the next day. 
and he's told that all your comrades are hanged, that your wife has been sold south, that you will be hanged tomorrow. And he stands up from the cut and he says, was not Christ crucified? Can you imagine that? It's, it's one of the great moments in human history, isn't it? Any intelligent reader coming on the confessions, the original confessions of Nat Turner, uh, and then reflects on those ref confessions for a while, would have to say to himself, um, this guy is a crazy lunatic.